The TypeScript 5.6 beta is looking pretty exciting, and I have to take the opportunity to talk about it with y'all. So let's dive in, because there's some features in here I've been waiting for for a while. Today, we're excited to announce the availability of the TypeScript 5.6 beta. To start using the beta, you can get it through NuGet or through NPM. Yep, you know how to install beta. Here's a list of all the new things. Disallowed, nullish, and truthy checks. Maybe you've written a regex and you forgot to call a dot test on it. Oh, I've seen this so often, done it a couple times myself. Thankfully, I don't write regex. I'm not paid enough for that. Or maybe you've accidentally written an arrow function, which creates an arrow function instead of the greater than or equal property. Yeah, this is actually really nice because this is a function definition you just wrote and you're not going to get a type error for it. It's just going to always be truthy. The idea of not allowing certain things as your truthy check is actually kind of nice. I like this. Or you misplaced uh, or. Yeah, a lot of useful things here this will solve. Error, this expression is always truthy. Error, this kind of expression is always truthy. Error, right operand of the double question marks is unreachable because the left operand is never nullish. Oh, that's such a good one. Who's written this code before? One's in chat if you've done this, where you did a comparison or a check and then had an or like this a nullish coalesce that never happened. I'm expecting a lot of ones for this because I've made this mistake so many times. That's huge. I'm happy ESLint catches it for you, but having TypeScript catch it for us is very nice. Note that certain expressions are still allowed, even if they're always truthy or nullish, like true, false, zero, and one. Since they're bare values, these are allowed still. That's good. Still idiomatic to do. And code like the following is useful while iterating or debugging. Yeah, if true or this, yeah. That's fair. I mean, they found the right balance for this. But here's what I'm excited about. The iterator helper methods. JavaScript has a notion of iterables, things which you can iterate over by calling a symbol.iterator function and getting an iterator, as well as iterators, which are the things that actually have the next method so you can get the next value. By and large, you don't typically have to think about these things when you toss them into a for of loop or a triple dot spread, and you just have them in a new array now. TypeScript does model these with the type of iterable as well as iterator, and now even the iterable iterator, <laughs> which asks us both. That's fun. F I'm sorry to non-FP people. This is going to hurt a bit, but for us functional people, I'm very excited. And these types describe the minimal set of members that you need to construct things for access through like for of, for example. So if you wanted to make something that you could do for of with, which uh, for of syntax, you have an array. Instead of doing for x equals zero, x is less than array length, x plus plus, or even array one dot map, you can iterate using for syntax for const element of array one. Now you're going through every element. Really cool pattern. But the ability to define something that isn't an array that you can iterate through this way is actually quite exciting. And to have a type to honor that is cool too. Iterables and iterable iterators are nice because they could be used in all sorts of places in JS. But a lot of people found themselves missing methods on arrays like map, filter, and also reduce. And for some reason, reduce. <laughs> Subtweet. That's actually really funny. Considering that this is an official Microsoft dev blog TypeScript announcement, being a little petty like this is actually hilarious and I love it. And as I mentioned, you might have seen my video where I go over all the cool new features coming to JS. I should have made that like 20 videos, but I'm generous, so I didn't. So please check it out if you haven't. I talked a lot about the iterator stuff in that, which was really fun. But TypeScript is doing the thing that they do every now and then where they add the new feature early because they know it's coming and they know devs want it now. So they give it to us now. So here we have a generator, function star, positive integers, and while true, yield i. So now whenever you call positive integers, it will give you a new value. What's really fun is now we can define a new iterator by calling dot map on this. If this was an array, theoretically this would run forever. But since it's an iterator, we're not actually generating the values until we call a dot take. And that's the magic of iterators is we can say we want to take five values from this chain of generating things. And now we'll get 246810 because we took this generator and then we map the outputs of this, just calling dot map to change them. And now we can take from this higher level thing and it behaves as expected. This is so cool. I love this. The same is true for methods like keys, values, and entries on maps and sets. So here's a function to invert keys and values that takes in a map and it outputs the type with these two things swapped and it just works. That's so cool. You can also extend the iterator object. Class zero extends iterator. Next returns value zero done false. And now we'll get an endless stream of zeros when we map. Sorry, it's endless stream of one because we're mapping to x plus one. That's really cool. TS is becoming C sharp. You have no idea. T TS came from the guy who made C sharp and it came from there for a reason. It's not just that both are Microsoft. It's that Hellsberg is the creator of C sharp 
as well as the creator of TypeScript. And he still actually files pull requests to TypeScript and has pushed some really big features, despite the fact that he was just like the language architect who designed it initially. He has stayed surprisingly involved. Really cool to see him so deep on the system stuff with C Sharp, as well as the web stuff with TypeScript. Oh boy, we have to talk about naming. <laughs> Everyone's favorite. Earlier, we mentioned that TypeScript has some types for iterable and iterator. However, like we mentioned, these act sort of like protocols to ensure certain operations work. That means that not every value that is declared iterable or iterator in TypeScript will have the methods that we mentioned above, but there is still a new runtime value called iterator. You can reference iterator as well as iterator.prototype as actual values in JavaScript. This is a bit awkward since TypeScript already defines its own thing called iterator purely for type checking. So due to this unfortunate name clash, TypeScript needs to introduce a separate type to describe these native built-in iterable iterators. So there's now built-in iterator. Oh, God. This is the problem with when they add things before they're in the language. By the language, I mean JavaScript. Now there's naming co uh, collisions, which is scary. <sighs> Lots of built-in collections and methods produce this type, and both the core.js and DOM types in libdts, along with types node, have been updated to use the new type. Similarly, there is a built-in async iterator type for parity. Async iterator does not yet exist as a runtime value in JS that brings the same methods for async iterables, but it is an active proposal, and this new type is preparing for it. Good stuff. More fun things. Built-in iterator checks and strict built-in iterator return. When you call the dot next method on an iterator with a return type on it, it returns an object with a value as well as a done property. This is modeled with the type iterator result. Yeah, so done is true or false. The value is the value. And with done is true, you still have the return value, but you can't get any additional values. The naming here is inspired by the way a generator function works. Generator functions can yield values and then return a final value, but the types between those two can be unrelated. That's actually interesting. You can have it be strings and then the final value just return numbers with the done true. That's fascinating. With the new built-in iterator type, we discovered some difficulties in allowing safe implementations of built-in iterators. At the same time, there's been a long-standing unsafety with iterator results in cases where t return types were any, which is the default. Ugh. For example, let's say we have an iterator result with string input any result. If we end up reaching for the value of the type, we end up with number or any, which is just any. Yeah, because if we're not returning a value when done is true, then any becomes the inferred return value. Hmm. It would be hard to fix this on every iterator today without introducing a lot of breaks, but we can at least fix it with most built-in iterator types that get created. 5.6 introduces a new intrinsic type called built-in iterator return, as well as a new dash dash strict mode flag called strict built-in iterator returns. Whenever a built-in iterator is used in a place like a libdts, they're always written with built-in iterator return types to be more strict. Very interesting. Let's see how this affects things. By default, it's return types any, but if you have the strict field on, it's now undefined. Under the new mode, if we use the built-in iterator return, our earlier example now correctly errors because value isn't returning something that we can call to uppercase because it's not, oh, sorry, oh, th this is the mistake. Sorry, they didn't do to uppercase properly because they need a capital C in uppercase. But since value is defined, to uppercase should be capital. But if it's undefined, we should get that error as well. Previously, it was being cast to any, so you got nothing here in this code would bomb. Now you get two useful errors. Much better. Support for arbitrary module identifiers. Every time I see emojis in JavaScript and TypeScript code, I get very happy because right now you can't actually use them for the things I want to. Like if I was to go to Google, I can do const banana equals hi. But what I can't do is const banana equals hi. I get an invalid or unexpected token. And that makes me sad. I wish it didn't. I wish I could use them for more. Let's see what we can use them for here. JavaScript allows modules to export bindings with invalid identifier names as string literals. Yeah, because you can't export this as banana because you can't import that because you can't use it as a module. It's funny because it also allows you to grab imports from these arbitrary names and bind them to valid identifiers. So banana as banana. So I can do that to, to convert to something I can actually use. That's hilarious, actually. It seems like a cute party trick. If you're as fun as we are at parties, I love the tone of these updates. These are, this is so, this is actually a fun read, but this does have uses for interoperability with other languages, specifically with WebAssembly stuff, since other languages might have different rules for what constitutes a valid identifier. It can also be useful for tools that generate code, like ESBuild using its inject feature. 
TypeScript 5.6 now allows you to use these arbitrary module identifiers in your code. Evan Wallace, the guy who made ES Build, is the one who contributed this change. Implement arbitrary module namespace identifiers. Interesting. Yeah, because you can export foo double colon new, which isn't a valid variable. By doing that, you now have the ability to export this from another language and access it in JavaScript by binding it with as. That's nice. More updates. No unchecked side effects imports. In JavaScript, it's possible to import a module without actually importing any values from it. These imports are often called side effect imports because the only useful behavior they can provide is by executing some side effect, like registering a global value or adding a polyfill to a prototype. Always hated these types of imports, but they make sense in certain times, in certain places. But apparently TypeScript had a quirk with this. If the import could be resolved to a valid source file, TypeScript would load and check the file. On the other hand, if no source code could be found, TypeScript would silently ignore the import. I've had that before, actually. This is surprising behavior, but it partially stems from modeling patterns in the JS ecosystem. For example, the syntax has also been used with special loaders and bundlers to load CSS or other assets. Your bundler might be configured in such a way where you can include a specific CSS file by writing something like this. Yeah, this is how I usually use these imports is to import a CSS file. But now I use Tailwind, so I don't have to care. But this masks potential typos on side effect imports. That's why 5.6 includes a new compiler option called no unchecked side effect imports. So if you're importing something that it as TypeScript doesn't know about, you'll get an error. I think this will actually error on the CSS case. I bet that's what they're about to say. Yeah. So you have to do a global that specifies, no, if it's a CSS module, it exists. Just let me do this. In fact, you might already have a file like this in your project. For example, running something like vite init might create a similar vite env.d.ts. Good to know. No check got added to TypeScript core. Interesting. Historically, we've just not used TSC for this, but cool that they're allowing us to compile TypeScript to JavaScript without actually having to check our types. Yeah, this allows for avoiding unnecessary type checks when performing semantic analysis necessary for emitting output files. One scenario for this is to separate JS file generation from type checking so the two can be run as separate phases. When TypeScript was originally proposed, this is how it was proposed. It was as two different things. I haven't been able to find the paper, but I read a paper really early in TypeScript's life that was very specific about these being separate and separate for a reason and by design. So it's awesome that they're finally integrating that into the language. They already had no emit, which is don't give me the output JS code, just check the types. So now you can run the no check to do build while iterating and then no emit to actually check the types after. You can even run them in parallel, even in watch mode. That's pretty cool. No check's also useful for emitting declaration files in a similar fashion. In a project where no check is specified on a project that conforms to isolated declarations, TypeScript can quickly generate declaration files without a type checking pass. I am trying to remember who I was seeing that was really huffy about this and wanted this fixed because it was soup, like so many layers of compilation to generate a DTS. This for mono repo users is gonna be huge. Note, if isolate declarations is not used, TypeScript may still perform as much type checking as possible to generate the DTS files. In that sense, no check is a bit of a misnomer. However, the process will still be lazier than a full type check, only calculating the types of unannotated declarations, which should be much faster than a full type check. No checks also available via the TypeScript API as a standard option. Internally, transpile modules and transpile declaration already used no check to speed things up, at least as of TypeScript 5.5, but now everyone can use them. Good shit. Ooh, allowing build with intermediate errors is going to be very interesting. TypeScript's concept of project references allows you to organize your code into multiple projects and create dependencies between them. Project references is one of those things that sounds really cool, especially for those big projects with TypeScript like performance issues that have never actually gotten working properly. Running the TypeScript compiler in build mode for tsc.b for short is the built-in way of actually conducting the build across these projects and figuring out which projects and files need to be compiled. Previously, this would also assume the no emit on error uh, flag, which means if there's an error, it won't give you the output. They seem to have fixed that. Yeah. In reality, this sort of rigidity made things like upgrades a pain. For example, if project B depends on A, then people more familiar with B can't proactively upgrade their code until the dependencies that it has are upgraded. They're blocked by work on upgrading A first. As of 5.6, the dash dash build mode will continue to build projects even if there are intermediate errors in the dependencies. Very interesting. Ooh, region prioritize diagnostics in error. That's going to be really fun for us big file folks. I'm a big fan of big files. The idea that the IDE and like the language server can prioritize based on where you are in the file is very interesting. When TypeScript's language service is asked for the diagnostics for a file, like are there errors, suggestions, deprecations, etc., it would typically require checking the entire file. 
Most of the time, this is fine, but in extremely large files, it can incur a delay. This can be frustrating because fixing a typo should feel like a quick operation, but it can take seconds if the file is big enough. To address this, TypeScript 5.6 introduces a new feature called Region Prioritize Diagnostics. Instead of just requesting diagnostics for the set of files, editors can now provide a relevant region of a given file. And the intent is that this will typically be the region of the file that's currently visible to the user. The TypeScript language server can then choose to provide two sets of diagnostics, one for the region and one for the file in its entirety. This allows editing to feel way more responsive in large files, so you're not waiting as long as those red squiggles to disappear. Typo. The actual checker TS file is huge, by the way. Let's take a look at it. The TypeScript checker TS file, which is most of TypeScript, is 52,545 lines. Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, I see why they prioritize this. This cut the responsiveness in the editor from three seconds to 143 milliseconds. That's insane. I guess TypeScript contributions just got way easier. I expect this file to get even bigger now because working in it sucks less. I changed my mind. My files aren't that large. <laughs> Anyways, this feature also includes quite a bit of work to make diagnostic reports more consistent throughout your experience. Due to the way our type checker leverages caching to avoid work, subsequent checks between the same types could often have different, typically shorter, error messages. Technically, lazy out-of-order checking could cause diagnostics to report differently between two locations in an editor, even before this feature. We don't want to exacerbate the issue. With recent work, we've ironed out many of the error inconsistencies. I'm sure we've all had the problem where our editor thinks there's an error where there isn't. Hopefully, this will help with that. Search ancestor configuration files for project ownership. Interesting. When types of files loaded in an editor using TS server, like Visual Studio or VS Code, the editor will try to find the relevant TS config file that owns the file. To do this, it walks up the directory tree from the file being edited, looking for anything named tsconfig.json. Usually it would stop at the first tsconfig.json, but imagine a project like this, where we have one here, but we also in the project have this there. Here, the idea is that source tsconfig is the main config and test.json's a configuration for running tests. Interesting. And this top level one is a solution style or multi-project root tsconfig. Instead of specifying any file, it just references all of the actual projects. The problem here is that when editing food test.ts, the editor would find project slash tsconfig.json as the owning configuration file, but that's not the one that we actually want. If the walk stops at this point, this might not be desirable. The only way to avoid this was to rename source slash tsconfig.json to something like tsconfig.source.json, and then all the files would at the top level tsconfig.json, which references every possible project. Instead of forcing devs to do this, 5.6 now allows the editor to continue walking up the directory tree to find other appropriate tsconfig files. This can provide more flexibility in how projects are organized and how configuration files are structured. Awesome. Some behavioral changes. Hopefully none of this is too relevant to y'all. Yeah. If you want to upgrade, make sure you check the changes part here. Link in the description if you're curious. We want to hop to what's next because I'm excited for the future. 5.6 is now feature stable. So the focus now is going to be bug fixes, polish, and low risk editor features. We'll have a release candidate available in a bit over a month, followed by a stable release soon after. They also have the whole iteration plan, which is quite exciting. Yeah, 5.6 is scheduled for September 3rd right now. This is a good release. Thank you, Daniel, as always, for writing this update. There are some very fun things in here. I love the tone. I love the update. I love a hell of a lot of these features. But I'm curious what you guys think. Are you as excited as me, or are you more iffy on it? Let me know in the comments. And until next time, peace nerds.